Well, I encourage you to grab your Bibles and open them to Ephesians chapter 6. We have been working our way slowly through studying the full armor of God and how the Christian is to understand that and apply it to life. And so this morning we'll be looking at verses 16 through 18 as we near the end of our study in Ephesians. Now, previously, when we looked at verses 13 through 15 last week, we concluded by examining Paul's call in verse 15 to put on our feet the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Now, in this, we were also reminded that we never outgrow our need for the gospel. We need this truth of Christ in our lives every moment. And so this should remind us that the gospel of peace, the good news that through faith in Christ, we are made right with God. That truth must be taken up and applied to the feet of believers every single day. Again, this is especially true in circumstances where we feel spiritually weak, where we feel vulnerable and we feel broken. Because the reality is that when we are most broken, our natural inclination is not to long for spiritual things. But when we're spiritually weak and even depressed at times, it is far more difficult to remember wonderful and important truths. And so we absolutely need gospel reminders. We need these important reminders that would point us back to what is true And who is truth? In this, we need to be rooted and grounded in Christ, especially so that we're not tossed around by our enemy or even by our own temptations in in sin. And so again, this is why last week we were reminded that we must not forget the gospel of peace. It's the only way in which the believer is then to go out in readiness. And so we absolutely need to remember to stand firm upon the foundations of this gospel. Not leaving it behind, but standing upon it always. It's the picture that Paul gives of having it on our feet as shoes. It's how we go forth. Because Christ has come. He has set us free and he has preached peace to our very souls. And so this means for those who've believed upon truth, they have a strong defense against their enemy. And the reason for that is because they're further equipped in Christ. And so this morning, as we go to examine verses 16 through 18, what we're going to seek to learn in our exposition is that we must take up faith, having assurance through the word and being alert in our prayers. And so we're going to read verses 16 through 18 in Ephesians chapter 6. And so hear the word of the Lord. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication, To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for the saints. And may God bless the reading of his word. Now, as we begin in our exposition, I don't believe that it can be overstated how much we need the gospel. We need to constantly be pointed to the truth that is in Christ and the hope we have in him. That's what guides us, what motivates us and should govern our entire lives. The gospel of Jesus Christ that brings peace. Now in that, there are going to be times where we are confronted with doubt, with fear, with conflict, even among one another, and with pain. I think the most difficult thing is that even in these circumstances in our life, we can often face things that are deeply overwhelming and at times unbearable. 
And so this is why Paul has outlined the whole armor of God for the believers in Ephesus. He wants it to be grounded in their minds and in their hearts. That in order for the Christian to withstand these battles, they must put on the armor of the God who has won the war. That's how we endure. And so we need to remember what Paul first told us in this section back in verse 10. He began by saying, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his mind. Now, that's how broken, struggling, and in battles of our own, we may stand strong. It's not in of ourselves. It's in the Lord. And so in every instance, whether we're doing great or we're struggling intensely, what we put on and take up must be rooted in Christ. This is a critical point for every believer. And I think it's difficult to grasp at times, especially when we talk about the spiritual realm and the spiritual warfare that we face. But we have to understand there is no cruise control in the Christian life. There is no time where we can just sit back and think that everything's fine and there's nothing against us. No, we do need to be sober that we are in the midst of a battle And Paul wants us to understand our enemy is real. He desires to destroy us. And our enemy is wanting for us to sit back and become numb and complacent with our faith. And so notice that at the beginning of our text, Paul begins in verse 16 by telling the believers, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. Now to put this in context for us a little It's valuable to remember that Paul is in prison. He is writing from prison and he is in chains for the gospel. Remember, as he told us back in chapter three, he was imprisoned for preaching Christ and especially Christ to the Gentiles. And so his circumstances of which he writes from are not ideal, at least not for his own gain. He is in a difficult, oppressive, harmful, and lonely state. And yet, Paul tells us that in all circumstances, we are to take up faith. Even in the most difficult of places, we need the gospel of Christ. This is the apostle's prayer. In fact, if you remember back in chapter 3, verse 1, Paul had told us ultimately he was a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. And as he continued in prayer later in chapter 3, he said in verse 14 through 17, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being. And here's the reason so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. From the very circumstance of prison, Paul was not talking of taking up some kind of confidence or hope in the Roman justice system or or even the church. No, he's putting his confidence and his hope and his belief in Christ. And this is the very prayer he has for the believers that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. And so Paul is reminding us here that no matter what comes our way or what difficulties we face, he is telling us to take up the shield of faith. Now, church, here again, we return to the Old Testament, where we find that the Lord himself is the shield of his people. Back in Genesis chapter 15, at the beginning of the Abrahamic covenant, We learn in verse 1 that the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. And the Lord said to Abram, fear not, Abram, I am your shield. And again, later in Psalm 144, verses 1 and 2, we learn, Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. He is my steadfast love and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield 
and he in whom I take refuge, who subdues peoples under me. Again, in these passages, we need to remember that God himself equips and covers us for battle. And so this should cause us to pay attention when Paul is instructing us in the armor that all the resources a Christian needs for fighting the good fight of the faith are found in Christ. These are not things of which you just take up for yourself. These are all things of which are found in Christ. And so faith here, when Paul says take up the shield of faith, it does not mean some kind of generic faith. It's not a faith in something you think you can do or or this baseless hope. It's not a wishful thinking. If I think it positively, then I can accomplish it. No, faith here means active faith in God, faith in Christ. It is faith in the wonderful promises of God Almighty. See, church, to have faith is to believe in God and in Christ. And to have faith is to know for certain that God will keep his word. It is to live with a type of confidence, not in yourself, but in God who is forever faithful. And so it's not simply to believe there is a God and to have faith in the facts about God. No, in fact, we know from the book of James that even the demons believe and shudder. And so we're talking here about saving faith. To take up the shield of faith is to take up saving faith, which on a basic level, saving faith is trust. It is self-abandoning trust in Jesus Christ. It is to be submitted to and shielded by the lordship of Jesus Christ in the believer's life. And so this is vitally important. I think especially since Paul continues in verse 16, telling us that this shield of faith must be taken up to extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Now, brothers and sisters, the attacks that we face from the evil one are rooted in the lies and deceitfulness of his own corrupt character. And so this means that any trouble or doubt that our enemy may cause us, we actually know from the scriptures that he is not speaking the truth, but in fact, he's speaking lies. Again, this is why Jesus said in John 8, 44, the devil was a murderer from the beginning. And does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Now again, when we think about this in light of the devil's character, the flaming darts that Paul speaks of are often his attack to get us to believe lies and and, and to really end up in misery. See, if the devil can get us to believe lies, then he has in one sense disarmed us or discouraged us. Simply put, church, if he can take our eyes off of Christ, if he can get us to think of of difficult things rather than Christ, and we believe then we are defeated, dumb, and downcast, then we have believed his lies. This is the ultimate aim in the enemy's flaming darts. It is to confuse and, if possible, disable the Christian. And so while we can seek to outline and even understand what the the darts specifically are, what we must ultimately know is that nothing can extinguish these fiery darts except the shield of faith. Nothing but what God gives us can help us stand against the evil one. Because to resist the enemy... We must have a living and active faith in the living and active God. Now, this is why Paul continues to say in verse 17, take the helmet of salvation. Now, if you remember last week, we were pointed back to Isaiah 59 in verse 17, where it prophesied concerning the Messiah saying he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. 
He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. And so ultimately we need to remember as Paul is instructing here to take up the helmet of salvation. Remember this helmet of salvation belongs to Christ. He alone has earned salvation and now he gives it to us and it is received by faith. And so this salvation that was earned by Christ and that is ours through faith in him is really to be applied as a helmet for our head to guard our mind. I think this should cause us to think of Paul's words in Romans 12 verse 2 when he says to the church, do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Church, if you are in Christ, it is still true that our minds need transforming. Our our hearts need comforting. And our our heads need covering. See, if we're going to stand firm in evil days, we have to have a true hope. And really, we need a true sense of God having saved us and making us alive in Christ. This is why when the apostle says we're to take up the helmet of salvation, we are to take it up and put into our minds the confidence and and, and even knowledge that in Christ, we are eternally secure. That nothing can pluck us out of God's hand. Again, we should take great comfort in the words of Paul in Romans 8. When he says in verse 38 through 39, Neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are God's children If we have been made alive with Christ, we are God's children. And not because we chose him, but because in mercy, he chose us. Remember how John begins his his gospel letter in his prologue. Those who were born of Christ are not born of the will or of blood or anything of the will of man, but of God. That is how we have become children of God. In his mercy, he chose us. And so that means we belong to him. We are kept by him. We are saved by him. And we are safe and secure in him. And so understand, all of this then is vital to the whole life of the Christian. And so we must take up the helmet of salvation and know the assurance of these truths. We need to know that we know that we know who God is and who we are in Christ. Now, see, it's easy to say these things. It's easy to talk about these things, even among the saints. And when, we, when we're gathered together, we feel the, the, the graces of, of being together, of singing together, of, of hearing God's word proclaimed. But when you're sitting alone, when you find yourself in the middle of this week and the deepest, most difficult trials come to you, do you know and believe these truths of scripture? Do you absolutely know them? Brothers and sisters, the only way you will come to know these truths, truly in a knowing of the gospel and have full assurance of faith, the only way you will be able to know those things is by God revealing all of them to you in his word. And so we need to humbly go before God and ask, Lord, would you reveal these truths to me? We need brothers and sisters in our lives to say, remind me, remind me of the truth of the gospel. Again, this is why Paul continues by telling us to take up the sword of the spirit, which he clarifies for us is the word of God. Now, interestingly, the sword is the only offensive weapon 
mentioned in this passage. All other pieces of armor are defensive. And the word is called the sword of the spirit because it is the weapon that the spirit of God specifically applies and supplies to the believer. And so we should take heart that just as the spirit inspired the word of God, the spirit applies the word of God to the believer. In fact, we see the profound truth of the word in Hebrews 4, verse 12, where the writer says, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word of God is powerful. It is life-changing. It is encouraging and convicting and cutting and Christ-pointing. And so this is why when we gather on the Lord's Day, we're gathered around the word of the living God. We are hearing God's word to us read and proclaimed and preached and applied to our lives. This is one of the powerful uh, parts of the Reformation Again, I've, I've shared with you before that prior to what took place in the Reformation, the word had almost just been set aside. The word had been put off to the, to the side. And in fact, if you go to a Roman Catholic mass, you'll find that the, that the podium is put off to the side. Uh, scriptures are, are, are read from, from selected areas and, and almost always out of context. And it's really off into the corner because what's in the center is a stone table because that's where the literal body and blood is then taken. The Eucharist is the primary focus. And in the, and in the Reformation, the battle literally was for the word of God, the purity of the word of God. And so what the reformer said was we, we need the word central in the gathering of God's people. We need God's word over us and in us and around us. And so they, they said, you know what, let's, let, let's take that, that, that podium off to the side, that little, that little uh, setting, and let's make big pulpits and let's put them in the center. And the reason for this historically was to communicate in the gathering of God's people, the word was primary and center. It was massive and over the people of God. Pulpits were large, not to communicate anything in man, but how small man was in comparison to how massive and important God's word is. And so we need the word of God. This is a reformation principle that has not gone away. And we still need reformation in churches today. And so when we gather, we're gathering around a historical reformation principle that goes all the way back to creation, that our minds need to be fixed upon God. We are to be seeking when we gather in every call to worship, in every scripture reading, in every sermon and benediction to be people of the word. Because truly, that's where we learn the doctrine of Christ. That's where we learn to be devoted to Christ and to give doxology to Christ. If ever I visit a church, I don't want to know what you think of something. I don't care about your ideas, your clever jokes. Give me the word because that is the only thing that will nourish my soul. Uh, Again, if you go out from here, if you go to any other church, whether visiting or moving away, don't look for a church that fits your most interesting fancy. Find a church that preaches the Bible and cares little for every other worldly thing. Find a church that devotes to that. Because truly, if a church does not take up the sword of the Spirit, it is a weak church and difficult church. And so Paul is telling us with utmost importance, we as believers must take up the word. We must humbly seek to know it and to rightly wield it. Again, this is probably one of the things that is, that is most concerning because Paul's language here is beautiful. It's powerful, but it's also terrifying 
to think of the ways that many have thought of the application of this. And many Christians, when they hear that this is the sword of the Spirit, while it's a wonderful truth, sometimes we tend to use it without context, without discipleship, or even without the Spirit who gives it. And so then what tends to happen is that we're more like a drunken soldier than a devoted saint. We swing the sword around without any regard for how we might harm someone with our handling. And so church, understand, as we take up this sword, we must learn to wield it with maturity and godliness. Again, as Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Brothers and sisters, how are you wielding the sword of the spirit? Is it with maturity or is it with madness? Friends, in our deepest struggles and our worst battles, one of the things we should think of when we take up the sword of the spirit is to pray the scriptures. This is one of the ways we can truly be trained in righteousness. I know this from my own trials, that praying through the scriptures is a powerful thing, not because it makes me powerful, but because it turns me towards the power of Christ in the word. And so in the midst of our battles, we must take up the sword of the spirit and stand our ground. Because in this spiritual battle that we are in, and we are in a spiritual battle, the believer is to take up the sword and fight against the evil one that he is attacking. This is the very thing that Christ did. In fact, in in the Gospel of Luke, we find that being tempted by Satan in the wilderness, Jesus responded to the, the attacks of the evil one by answering with the word of God. In Luke's gospel, in chapter 4, verse 8, one of Jesus' responses, in fact, was to say, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Now, I've always found it quite fascinating that while the evil one continues to twist the Psalms, Jesus continues to answer with the book of Deuteronomy. He continues to show the truth of the word, while the enemy continues to twist the word. And so in this, Christ has shown us how we may stand against temptation and the devil. And so while it's true that the blows of the evil one truly may be absorbed and and even deflected by the breastplate of righteousness and the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation, the Christian has been supplied with a weapon with which to strike back, which is the living word of God. And so church, my prayer is that we may be able to say as the psalmist does in Psalm 119, verse 11, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Man, if you don't know what to pray, if you are not sure how to endure and take up the word, start with Psalm 119. Pray through those verses because truly it's the psalmist's cry to before the Lord, how he loves the word, how he longs to meditate on the law and to follow the Lord no matter what. And so church, the greatest thing we are to do is to take up the word. That is a great weapon for us. We're to store it in our hearts. We're to memorize it and be in it that we might not sin against God. As Charles Spurgeon once said, visit many good books, but live in the Bible. Now, I don't know if you know much about Charles Spurgeon, but he was one who deeply wrestled battles. He wrestled with deep depression. He he wrestled with gout. and, And really, he was often plagued by pain and hardship in his ministry. And so these words, when he says, visit many good books, but live in the Bible, that is not from someone who cleverly just runs off a sentence. That is from someone who's experienced deep pain and knows the value of living beneath the word. 
And so that's where we must be rooted and grounded in the word of the living God. Now, see, there are times when in the most difficult circumstances, we feel beyond weak and incapable. And I think this is where the Apostle Paul reminds us that there is not a time in the Christian's life where they can survive without coming before God. In verse 18, Paul continues by calling us to be praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. Christian, when you cannot use your sword, and even when you can hardly grasp the shield of faith, you can and you must pray. Even if you are at a place right now where you feel the answer is, no, I can't. I don't know how. I I cannot grasp the words. I don't know how to come before God and what to say to the Lord. That's fine. Pray that. Lord, I don't know how to come before you. I don't know how I'm feeling. What is going on? Gather brothers and sisters around you and pray that. That is still a prayer that must be prayed. See, what's interesting and almost terrifying is that sometimes we can be so consumed in our own pain and our own perspective that we neglect the power of prayer in our lives. Again, remember that much of what Paul begins with in each section in the book of Ephesians is with prayer. In chapter 1, he says in verse 17 through 19, He prays that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might. Church, again, one of the greatest things you can do in the midst of struggling with how you feel is to pray what you know in the scriptures. It is to cry out to who you know, which is the Lord. Again, Paul specifically tells us that we are to pray with all prayer and supplication. Now in this, there are, there are different kinds of prayers to pray. And the believer is really to use them all. For example, and I think most importantly, in all things, we need to remember that we are coming before a holy, righteous, and awesome God. Again, the psalmist declares in Psalm 47, verse 8, our our call to worship text. In verse 8, we are told God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. Church, in your prayers, do you acknowledge and pray that God is sovereign? That he is sovereign and he is in control. That when you laid your head on the pillow last night and you woke up this morning, this morning, it is first because God is in control and he is merciful. Again, to pray these truths and to praise and greatly love the God of the Bible is to bring prayers of adoration before God. And even another type of prayer is the prayer of confession. James chapter 5 verse 16 tells us, Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. A church We need one another. We certainly need to pray for one another. In fact, I always find it so incredible that in James 5, we we learn that we confess our sin before the, the Lord to be forgiven. In confessing our sin to one another, we find healing. We need each other. Ultimately, the the giver of healing is God, but he uses his body to strengthen believers. In fact, I think what's incredibly important for us to remember is that if you are a covenant member here, that is part of our covenant commitment to one another, to pray 
for one another. And so in the midst of the battles we face and the temptations we wrestle, we are to be a praying people that confesses sin to one another. And we need to never forget that we are to give thanks. Again, in the time of our pastoral prayer, I I had read 1 Thessalonians 5, where verse 16 through 18 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Have you ever thought of giving thanks as part of God's will for you? Uh, we are definitely in a season of thanksgiving. But to pray prayers of thanks is more than the cultural practice of posting on social media the, the people that we're thankful for, the things that we're thankful for. It, it is to fix our minds upon the will of God and to give thanks to Him in all circumstances. And so certainly Paul wants us to have a focus on and a devotion to prayer. And notice also in the last part of verse 18 that he says, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. There is an alertness we need to have in this life. Again, as as we know, We have a very real enemy that lurks around seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5 tells us that quite clearly. And at times, I think we will even come across those who oppose us and want to break us down. And in some cases, truly some of those are used by the evil one to attack us. But at the same time, we must keep alert with all perseverance. There is a seriousness in this command from the apostle. And so we need to remember that prayer is a vital thing to the Christian's spiritual life, just as oxygen is to his physical life. I love when when Spurgeon was once asked, what is more important, uh, prayer or the word? Prayer or reading of the word? And he said, which is more important, breathing in or breathing out? Prayer is vital, even in our most deepest struggles. If we don't even know how to pray, we should gather a trusted brother or trusted sister and ask them to pray with us. Again, I think prayer is one of the most important things easily overlooked by the church. We love to quote that we're to be a house of prayer, But we don't think about the fact that we're to be devoted together and pray in that house together. John Owen once said, I would rather judge a man's theology from his prayers than from his books. That's a man who wrote a lot of books. Again, if you ever study Reformed theology, one of the things you find more than anything that they talk about is prayer. Prayer was vital In the Reformation, after the Reformation, and today, it is a vital thing for the believer. And so, dear Christian, let me ask you, do you pray? Are you alert in your prayers? Again, if we do not pray, there is a great concern for our lives. In fact, John Bunyan once said, prayer will make a man cease from sin, or sin will entice him to cease from prayer. Friends, your silence before God does not help you. If you are silent before the Lord, it is no help to you. In fact, it will only intensify your pain and your struggle, and it will increase your numbness to the means of grace. Because without prayer, we are like a drowning person gasping for air. We cannot survive that way. In fact, I think a clear sign that a believer has surrendered themselves to defeat and difficulty is that they either refuse to pray or they do not prioritize prayer. And I am not saying that because I am pointing out any individual. I know the dreadfulness of that myself. 
So church, we need, we need, it's not an urging of what I want you to do. We need prayer. We need to be in prayer. We need to enter into the throne room of grace before a holy God who has allowed us to come before him because of Christ. And we need the prayers of others along with us. In fact, I think this is why Paul concludes this instruction in verse 18 by saying, we are to be making supplication for all the saints. We are to humbly come before the Lord, begging and pleading with him for all the saints. This is why we started having a Sunday evening prayer service. Yes, there are certainly all sorts of things that we could preach through. Many things I I long for you to know and to understand. But believe me, in all the list of things, the thing that was most evident when we began that service was the priority needs to be prayer. And if you were to come tonight at, at the service, one thing you would find that we are going to begin with is, are there needs among us? That's the question. Who among us needs prayer and how can we pray for one another? And then from there, who else can we pray for? Can we pray for Keith and Carmen in France and for the mission work that they are doing? Can we pray for the other believers even outside of our local? Because we are not alone. Uh, We are to be committed to one another here, but even outside of here. How are we committed to them? How are we praying for them? These are things that should be on our minds. And so saints, understand, there are other saints among us that are struggling and are weak. There are those who are hurting and battling intensely in this very congregation. And so what we need in care for one another is to constantly keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints. Again, there will always be those among us who are battling something, but there will also be always someone, many among us, who are quick to prayer. And we should gather both in a room and learn to pray and process and work through those things together. Again, throughout the book of Acts, this is what we see. We constantly find the church in prayer, in suffering, in trials, in warfare. They prayed. And why? Well, they did this because their confidence was in the Lord Jesus Christ. That they were able to come boldly before the throne of grace. And so really, in our, in our prayers, in the midst of battle, we are called to stand firm in Christ, not because we feel strong, but because we are made strong in the Lord. And so church, are you standing firm in Christ? In your battles and in your victories, in your studies and in your prayers, are you standing firm, not in yourself, not in how great your theological studies are, not how, how, how great your week has been, but are you standing firm in Christ because he alone is the strength that you must have? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to a close, pray and ask, Lord, that you would help us to stand firm in the Lord that we would be clothed with spiritual armor. And Lord, I I pray truly that this would be a house of prayer for all the saints. I pray, Lord, that as we gather again this evening, that, Lord, we would be strengthened by your word. That, Lord, we would be edified by the prayers of your people. And that we would be challenged to go out in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we give you great thanks for your word. That it guides us and protects us. That it preserves us and points us to Christ. 
God, I pray that as we go out into this week, even when we feel alone, Lord, help us to not isolate from your body. Lord, I pray that we would remember the truth of James 5, that we should be confessing our sin to one another. We should call for the elders to anoint us, to, to pray over us. And so, Lord, in our, in our deepest struggles and our most fierce battles, help us, Lord, to look to Christ, to call upon the church to come beside us, And Lord, in all these things, would you preserve us? Would you sustain us? And Lord, would you guide us together as a body to stand firm in the Lord? We pray and ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.